Hey, everybody. Keith Hilson at the Trombone Shop at Schmidt Music. I am so excited to have all of you involved with our live stream here. We're just working on getting the tech up and going, so hopefully everything is working here. If you are seeing everything, please let us know. You know give me a heads up. Make sure that the stream is working here. Um, again, I am so excited that we have the opportunity to share some time together here. Obviously, there are some very unique things going on right now with this and so I think this is going to be a great opportunity for us to share back and forth I love it that we've already had some folks in the comments already sharing some information back and forth having some conversations which I am so excited about here All right, so I think we're getting call caught up here. So I want to share a couple of things first off about myself and about Schmidt Music. So a lot of folks know about the trombone shop now, but a lot of folks don't realize is the trombone shop is actually a part of a bigger company, namely Schmidt Music. So I've been in my role here for just about six years now. I started in April of 2014. Uh, before that, I was doing graduate studies in trombone performance. And it was one of those things all of a sudden one day had somebody come through and say, hey, you know, we've got an opportunity here. You know, are you interested in maybe starting up this trombone shop? And I said, okay, well, first off, tell me what this trombone shop is, what's going on with it, and then let's go from there. So Schmidt Music has been around since 1896, so we're going on 123 years now, and it's been a family-owned company right here in the Twin Cities for that entire time, which I think is absolutely amazing, incredible. And this, the idea a number of years ago um, came to the company of kind of starting the special shop kind of little stores within a store the idea being that we have a saxophone shop we have a trumpet shop a flute gallery a trombone shop these really specialty areas so that we can really help all of our players from the very first beginning player all the way up through to the top and professional and everybody in between and really aim to be a resource with all of that and it's been really amazing to see all of the growth that has happened with that and the part, all of you, the, the role that you've played in that has really been incredible. It's, it's really something astonishing. So I really, really thank you for all of that. We've got a whole bunch of things on the docket today. Um, we've had some really great questions already submitted, some different ideas that I'm going to be talking about here. Um, so as we go through, if you've got some other ideas as well, please make sure that we get them on the list here as well. I'd be very, very happy to include all of those as well. One of the questions I get a lot is, what is my own personal setup? What am I playing you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? What am I using when I'm practicing? What am I using when I'm gigging here? So I wanted to start off and share a little bit with what I'm playing. So I am primarily an alto player, tenor player. Um, I do bass trombone, I do euphonium, but really my, kind of my, my core is alto and tenor here. So on alto, I have the Kunal and Hoyer. So this is the Kunal and Hoyer slow car model here. Um, in case you're not familiar with Kunal and Hoyer, they are a German maker. Um, we don't see a ton of their instruments over here outside the altos, but uh, really, really great instruments. Um, I actually got this back when I was in my undergrad. So around 2000, I think around 2003 or so, um, I had picked this up here and it's been my go-to alto ever since then. Now, I've had a few people come and say, it's like, oh, it looks like some of the other altos out there. That's because a lot of the other um, you know, great alto options that we've seen pop up in the last five, 10 years have actually uh, been developed off of the slow car model. This has been really kind of a basis for a lot of this here. So the slow car alto, and I pair this up with a Bach 7C. Um, the, what we use in alto can be a really, really interesting thing. If you talk to a lot of folks, uh, they'll tell you it's not necessarily so much about the cup width on alto that we're worried about. A lot of it's more about the cup depth and what's going on with the throat and back bore. If you take a look at a lot of the artist model alto pieces, like the the, uh, the Griego Ian Belfield model, or if you take a look at the Hammond um, um, you know, alto models that they've developed and some of the others there, they tend to be fairly wide pieces actually, but 
pretty shallow. For alto, I think you want to have a lot of compression, and that helps a little bit with the airflow as well. My approach with alto typically is a little bit lighter airflow, a little bit more focused, but not fast. If you, if you take the air and really try to shove it through, what you get is this really bright, just kind of almost like a small bore tenor sound, uh, where it has a lot of brightness and focus and edge. And that's the, the exact opposite of what we want. With alto, there needs to be a lightness, a, a color to the sound. It needs to kind of float a little bit. And so sometimes a, a mouthpiece with a little bit shallower, a couple little more compression helps us with that kind of air. instrument I've loved for a long time. I love how this alto plays. Um, it's been very, very versatile. And for me, it's a really great solo alto. Um, for some other work, especially when we start getting into some more you know, orchestral settings, especially a little bit larger orchestral settings, there's a couple other directions we can go that we might talk about here as well. But Kulin & Hoyer Slow Car Model Alto, Bach 7C mouthpiece here. Most of my work, though, is on small board tenor. So for my small bore tenor, the King 3B has been my go-to for a very long time. Um, when I started in college, I was playing on a Yamaha 691Z, the predecessor to the Yamaha 891Z, which is one of my favorite uh, quote-unquote production small bore tenors out on the market right now. Uh, the 691, I played it for a long time, it was a good horn, I basically wore it out and said, okay, it's time to look for something else. I had a friend who loaned me a 2B+, Plus, which is that, you know, that little bit smaller, like about around 490 you know, bore, 490, 500 bore, and took a look through, you know, played it a while for a while, really loved it and said, I want to go out and find, you know, brand new ones. So around 2000 or so, went out there, started looking, couldn't find any 2B pluses out there, but played my first 3B and realized, boy, I've been working really hard on the 2B plus. The 3B for me with my air approach, you know, that, that 508 board just has more focus to the sound. I can feel like I have more response because I'm able to put more air into the instrument. I can get more volume out of it. So this 3B has been with me now. Boy, we're going get, to get on 20 years. Um, it's still going strong, which kind of amazes me at times here. And I'll pair it up with a couple of different mouthpieces. Um, my go-to, you know, um, kind of more section mouthpiece, or if I'm doing like some small group work, I'll use a box six and a half AL. Um, and you'll notice a trend here as far as the box mouthpieces go. Believe me, I've tried all kinds of different things here. That's a hazard of the job of what I do is having all these different options. And I keep going through. And just for me personally, I always come back to the box and say, boy, it just feels more familiar. It does more of what I expect it to do there. So I understand I'm a little bit of an outlier there. And that's OK. I mean, the box mouthpieces are what they are. And they've been a mainstay for a long time. So I don't feel bad about it. They do what I need to do. When it comes to any equipment at all, that's what we need to have. It does this do what you need it to do. If it does, then that's all we need to know about that. So, King 3B with the uh, box 6.5 AL. <laughs> I can get a little bit of warmth, a little bit of fuzz around the outside of sound if I want, which in certain settings I like. But honestly, for a lot of the work I do, which is a lot of salsa playing, a lot of horn section work, I actually end up using my 7C again. Uh, my 7C has really kind of become my go-to commercial gigging mouthpiece in a lot of settings because um, I think it gives me a little bit more brightness, a little bit more focus. Um, I find it blends better in a section, whether I'm playing, um, you know, especially like a rock horn section with trumpet, a sax, where we're putting some more volume out. I feel like I can get a little bit more balance and kind of balance the timbre a little bit more with those other instruments. And with the salsa playing, the 7C, I feel like I have a little bit more control in the upper register um, especially when we're pushing a lot of those high dynamics. I feel like I have more control with the 
can see there. So again, King freebie, I've been a freebie player for a long time. Am I looking at other things? Again, part of the hazard of the job, but this has been a workhorse for me and it'll take a special horn, I think, to <laughs> convince me to play something else there. So we've got the Elton, we've got the small board tenor. Now, what are we playing on for large board tenor? Now, this is a little bit different, a little bit unique. What I'm playing for the large board tenor is a prototype horn of ours. This is part of a project we've been working on as a company for quite a few years. Um, you know, some of you may be familiar with this previously as our S Custom line here. Uh, we are now referring to it as Lake City. We've kind of changed our branding for a few reasons. They're the same exact instruments we've been going through developing all of this time here. The whole idea behind this Lake City project is that we are trying to create really, really great playing instruments that we're able to offer at a little bit better value because we're working directly with the manufacturer to design these, to build these here. Now, we're certainly not the first company to do this. There are others who have been doing this kind of stuff as well for you know quite a few years, but our approach has really been very, very focused. We don't want to have a huge catalog for, for example, say 10 different large board tenor trombones and you know, 10 different bass trombones and, you know, 15 different tuba designs, etc. What we really want to find is one really great playing large board tenor. One really great playing alto. The alto was actually the first one that we really got locked in. Um, that was the, at that time, the S Custom Colmere alto. We've renamed it as the Lake City, you know, um, ATV 415 alto trombone. Um, same exact design though, um, but we've really kind of gotten a large board tenor and actually euphonium locked in here as well. And so I've been going through and this instrument has kind of been my go-to large board tenor for the last you know several months. Now part of that is because I really want to go through and keep testing these instruments out. We've gotten a ton of feedback on them from a lot of different man of players and educators all around our area, giving feedback, what they like, what they don't like, how do we go through and develop all of this. And so we've been getting a lot of that feedback, but I want to keep going through and playing them and make sure that A, you know, they, they hold up, they take the abuse, all of these important things, but just to keep reconfirming myself that, yeah, these are instruments I really, really like. And guess what? They are. I've really appreciated them, and they do a, a lot of really great things. I think they're very balanced instruments. So I'm playing on a prototype of our Lake City 415 large board tenor trombone. Um, I've been playing around with both yellow brass and gold brass. For me, the yellow brass actually, interestingly, I think has a little bit more depth and core to the sound than I think the gold brass does, which is a little interesting. But now lately I've been pairing it up with a Bach 4G. Um, I, I go between like a Bach 5 and a Bach 4 rim. So anywhere from like a you know 25.5 and getting towards like a 26 millimeter rim. And it kind of depends on how everything's going. The spring, everything's been swelling up a little bit. My lips have felt a little weird. And so the, the 4G rim just gives me a little bit more space. I feel a more secure, like I have a little bit more control. <laughs> something I, I continue to be impressed with. I've taken it obviously out and you know played it on performances and it's good to keep getting feedback on all of this as well, kind of how things are going. Now I'd mentioned that we had a couple of other instruments as well. On a quick side note here, we have had the alto trombone in place for a little while. And you'll know, excuse me while I'm running in and out of the shot here, but that's one of the cool things about being able to have it in the shop here, in the trombone shop. And by the way, trumpet shop, you can't see that in the shot, but off to this side are all of our trumpets as well and cases and everything. Over here, we have all of our mouthpieces. Behind the camera, we have all of our mutes and accessories and everything else here. So one of the really cool things with this is that we're able to, again, kind of grab instruments on the fly. So our... Lake City Alto Trombone, again, in a lot of ways was inspired by the 
uh, Kulon Hoyer's full car. And we're, we're far from the first to have utilized this design, or really just more of kind of that, that German Teutonic inspiration, the design ideas behind it. But again, it's a real instrument I've really been impressed with. And one of the things I find with this versus the slow car is I do feel like there's a little bit more broadness to the sound, a little bit more volume. <laughs> a little bit of complexity that's maybe missing in the sound, but I do like it has a little bit more projection as well. This is something I found really come in handy in, in the alto work uh, that I do do, which a lot of times is um, a lot of orchestral settings, especially it seems like once a year or so I end up playing the Mozart Requiem, and unless, unless I end up playing in a true you know, period specific sized orchestra and using period appropriate instruments, a lot of times I find the slow car alto is just a little bit light in terms of timbre and something like this, um, I feel like I can, I can have a little bit more balance without sacrificing a lot of that, again, that, that the alto characteristic to the sound that we are looking for here. So <laughs> I hope that's informational here. Um, let's take a look and see if anybody else has got any other suggestions right away. Okay, got it. So, and of course, if you have other specific questions about my personal setup, let me know. We had a great question from Bob about mutes here. So let's talk about mutes a little bit. All right, and so specifically, Bob was asking about uh, cup mutes and bucket mutes and uh, plunger mutes potentially there, um, especially for small bore tenor. Um, you know, coming back to playing, uh, I'm going to be doing some section work in a big band. What are going to be some really great mute options? And not interested in Humes and Berg. Um, you know, the Humes and Berg uh, fiber mutes, um, you know, stone lined, have, they're, they're obviously a go-to, um, you know, in, in certain settings. Honestly, I have a set of the stone lined mutes at home that I will use in certain big band settings. Um, actually, I really like them for a lot of like traditional jazz Dixieland work, but you know, we understand that there are some challenges with them as well. They're maybe not as responsive. They may have intonation issues um, with them. And so, of course, we do have a whole host of other options as well. And Bob said, hey, can you play some of these here? So let's start off with bucket mute. Um, he mentioned in particular a couple of different bucket mutes. The easy uh, bucket mute, you may have seen this one. This is the big black one that clips over the bell, kind of like the, the, the Humesenberg velvet tone, but obviously very, very different shape, um, different physics. It doesn't have any of the, of the stuffing, the deadening material in it. It's just is essentially a just a plastic shell with it. Unfortunately, we don't have any of the easies, but we do have a couple of other options right now. The other big one he mentioned was the Joe Ral bucket mute. I remember seeing this one come through uh, when I was in my undergraduate studies. It was really kind of a new concept because this was the first really great option we had outside of the Humes and Berg bucket mutes here. So the Joe Ral obviously is an aluminum mute. We've got our deadening material, our stuffing in here. And when we have it like that. I think it really does it in a, give in a lot of ways a very characteristic bucket sound, obviously. Um, what I like about the aluminum is, I, with the way it's designed, it doesn't feel like it, we get too much projection out of it, which is sometimes a worry with a, a metal mute, depending on the setting. I mean, there's a lot of instances, cup mutes, straight mutes, others, where we do want to have that projection. We do want to be really putting that focus sound out into the audience. The bucket mute's different, right? We, we have a very different sound profile we're going for, but... The Joe Reld seems to do a really nice job of balancing all of that. And overall, the response is from you know, bottom to the register to the top of the register is pretty good. Yeah, 
it's not bad. I have to push a little bit as I'm getting to the upper register, and frankly, it loses a little bit of that woofiness to it as we get enough towards the high up. But, you know, it, it, it's all right. If there are any issues I hear folks talking about with the Joe Rail Mute, it's the weight. Um, they are, even the small bore one, so this is specifically designed with small bore tenor. They do have a large bore tenor. They do have a bass trombone. Even the small bore tenor one has got a little bit of heft to it, and it does... It does weigh the horn down quite a bit this way. Um, so if you are somebody who does have hand issues, if you're really conscious of the weight of the instrument, that can be problematic. The other thing that happens with these a lot of times is they will fall out of the instrument while you're playing, again, because there's so much front weight to them. Um, I've certainly seen that happen in performances and things. So it's something to think about there, but there's a reason that they've been a go-to for a very long time. But we do have another option in the shot that I think is worth looking at. Specifically, this one here. So this is the soft tone mute. And this has been around quite a while, a while as well. This is a unique design. It's essentially just a neoprene cover here. Um, it's available in a number of sizes for trombone as well as trumpet. And it's just a neoprene cover. And the idea here is that you could use it either as a bucket mute or substitute for bucket mute or as a practice mute. Um, so for bucket mute, what we do is we just drape it over the top of our bell something like this, and we can kind of figure out exactly what we want that to look like. And sometimes the physics of it are a little interesting, but we get to put on something like that, and then when we go to play, Is it, again, does it have the depth of sound, the complexity of something like the Joe Ral? Well, maybe not. And you could play around with exactly how you position this on your bell. You have to be very careful about how you put this on. If you get too much of the material covering the bell, you get a ton of back pressure in a hurry. And that's actually one of the issues I have with it when they say that it can be used as a practice mute. Boy, the idea is you take, you pull it over your bell like this, and now... <laughs> go like that, it's exceptionally stuffy. I mean, it, it, it's, it's essentially impossible to play like that. Now, I have seen some folks who have done some interesting things. Um, they've taken and actually cut holes in this here to help to mitigate some of that airflow, and that's been helpful. So, frankly, I, I, I have a couple of different options that I'll use. This is one, though, I always keep in my mute bag, though, because it is portable, and that's the other thing with bucket mutes that are problematic is that they are not terribly portable. They take up a lot of room, and you know, typically, unless I know I have to be using the bucket mute, I'm not going to be bringing a bucket mute along. However, I can always keep one of these along in my bag there. If I have to pull out you know, a bucket, it's going to give me a pretty decent approximation here. So let's move on to cup mutes for a minute. So for cup mutes, again, we're trying to stay away from the Humes and Berg here. So for the most part, what we're looking at a couple of things, very often metal. Now, we have a, an option or two that are not metal that we'll take a look at here. But a lot of times we're going to be looking at metal. And the other thing we run into a lot of times are movable uh, cups. So, for, for example, like the Dennis Wick here, this is a popular go-to in the shop here. And this in the Joe Rail and some others have movable cups. So the idea here is that we can go through and adjust how close or how far away the cup is to the bell, thus giving us more control over what the, again, what the sound experience is like here. So, let's put the Dennis Wick in here. against the other, I think, really popular go-to uh, cup mute in this design, the Joral. And by the way, you notice, in, in case you haven't had to deal with mutes before, you notice me breathing into the bell here. 
we want to get moisture a lot of times inside the bell, obviously, so that the corks will stick. Um, if the corks are dry, they have much more of a tendency to fall out, and then you have your mute fall on the floor, and if you're lucky, it just gets damaged. If you're unlucky, then somebody hears it, and you get in trouble, and nobody wants that. So, a little bit of warm air condensation inside the bell here, and this is the Joral. <laughs> I feel like the Dennis Wick has got a little bit more warmth to it and seems a little bit more open. Um, I do like the projection that I'm getting out of this, and I think we could probably warm up the sound a little bit more, for example, by playing around with some of the distance there on the cup. <laughs> Yeah, so there already I'm getting a more accurate cup sound. It is playing around with the response a little bit there, but um, I like it. Um, so, the, and there's a reason the Dennis Wick and the Joe Rail are real go-tos for us in the shop. You know, a lot of folks who are looking for that really great next step up cup, you oftentimes go with one of these two here, but there are a few others. This is one of my personal favorites. This is from Trumcore. Uh, Trump Corps Mute Maker, they really got their start in the 90s. Um, and we see them more on the trumpet side, but I think they've got a number of really, really great trombone mutes, uh, euphonium mutes, and some other stuff as well. Now, they do um, some metal mute work, but frankly, a lot of stuff I really like from them is more in their fiber mute. So the overall design concept is more like the Humesenberg Stone line, where we're using a fiber material here. But the, the response and sound and everything is a completely different experience. One of the things that makes this unique is that it does have a movable cup on it. Um, so we get the advantages of that, but we're going to have a difference in that sound because of the material. And you notice with the way this is designed, I have to bring the cup up quite a bit more there, but that's okay. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> responsive that is there's a different woodiness to the sound that i think is really really appealing but it is a little bit different sound i think with this you'd have a little bit different time blending in a section than um, some of the others so i think that's something to keep into account here um, but i think they really are a great option the other side of the coin with the trunk cords they are kind of expensive um, you know, with a lot of the other mutes, we're sitting around, you know, anywhere from about, you know, 60, 70, 80 dollars. Uh, the Trump Corps about 125. So it's a little bit different experience. But again, it, it's a favorite because just how well they play from the bottom to the register to the top register, I think they do fantastically. All right, and one more. Tom Crown, this has been a go-to for a long time here as well. So we have an aluminum mute here. They do, uh, I don't think in the cup mute, in the straight mutes, they do have a couple of other material options as well in this. Um, not a movable cup. So this is a fixed cup here. And this is going to be a little different as well. Um, with the Tom Crown, they have really thick, chunky corks on there. And part of the idea is that you will go through and shave them down to best fit your own particular bell taper. So it may not be a perfect example here, but I think we'll be in the ballpark. Again, I feel like in order to really get the best effect, I would need to shave the corks down no more because I'm getting I'm getting a lot of brightness and projection. I'm not getting as much of the, the cup sound, a little bit more of that muted sound that we're looking for there. And frankly, in this particular case, there's not a much a lot of room to deal with there. Um, and if you're going to be using this on a large board tenor, boy, yeah, it might even be a little bit less space there. 
Got it. So we've got bucket mutes, we've got cup mutes. Um, one other question that Bob had asked about were plunger mutes there. And he said, are, is there anything more ergonomic than just the old bathroom plunger? You know, and it's a really great question for, you know, a lot of folks coming in. If they say, I'm just looking for a basic plunger mute, I will send them to the hardware store. Um, that's kind of been my go-to for a long time. Um, because for me, I, 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 I like the control that I can get out of that. Um, I like the sound, and frankly, I like the price as well. But there are a few other options. Mutech, um, in theory, still has a plunger mute available. Um, they've been really hard to get a hold of. So I don't know if that's a really reliable resource, but we have our trusty Humes and Berg. So Humes and Berg does actually have a, they have got a couple of different you know, a plunger options. They've got a stone line option, but they do have a rubber option as well. And the nice thing about this, ergonomically, we've got our finger hole there. So we can do it like that. When I'm using this, I would probably use my middle finger there. So that way I have the, you know, the second and fourth fingers around here. And they actually even build in a little lip there so you can have some nice control. <laughs> It's a good plunger. I mean, I think if you really want to get into it, there are folks who talk about drilling holes. And actually, interestingly, this one does have three little holes drilled through it there. So they're, they're thinking about some of the airflow stuff. It's a nice plunger option. Now, they are a little bit more expensive than your standard run-of-the-mill, you know, hardware store plunger. But, you know, it's a great material. It's, it's a little strike in there. And it is ergonomic. So I think there's some really nice stuff happening with that. All right. I've got plenty of other things we could take a look at. Let me take a quick look at the comments and see what else, if anybody else has got anything they want me to cover right away. And by the way, I love all of the commentary, the conversations, discussions that are happening here. Again, that was part of the idea why we wanted to do this in the first place is to open, you know, some of those dialogues up, which I think are awesome. Um, let's get to Andrew. Andrew had a question about 5084 small bore tenors. Um, in particular, asked about the Q33, which we actually have in the shop here. And by the way, if you hear any phones or anything ringing while we're going on here, we are open today. That's one of the really great things about the Trombone Shop is that we are a full service retailer. We are open seven days a week. And so if you happen to be in the area, you can certainly feel free to stop by on by, although not for the next couple of weeks, which we'll talk about towards the end of the video here. Um, but we are a full service retailer here. And so, you know, we can have folks that you're welcome to stop by whenever come into the shop. Obviously, I'm not around seven days a week here, but we've got a ton of really great staff who are able to help with all of this here. So if you hear any bustling, any store noise, that's what's going on. We're just glad to have people out and about and again, being involved in music here. So let's talk a little bit about the Shires Q series. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, um, SE Shires is a custom maker built out of Boston, um, originally founded by Steve Shires, although he's recently left the company, gone off to his own project now. Um, he's building custom French horns, um, but SE Shires obviously continues. Um, he started the company back in the middle 1990s after working with Getson and Osmond Brass and Schilke and in a number of different areas. Um, in the early middle 2000s, uh, Shire started working with Eastman, uh, Eastman Music Company, which is based in China, of course. And um, Eastman had went to Steve Shires and said, teach us how to build brass, you know, not only help us design the instruments, but show us how to do this. How do we make these instruments the best we can? And we've seen this continuing relationship and we've seen all the benefits of that. Um, when in 2014, um, Shires uh, filed for bankruptcy, Eastman stepped in, purchased them, and said, just keep building. We're gonna help take care of the business. You folks do everything you do. And of course, you know, the, the rest is history. We've seen what's happened with Shires over the past five, six years. Um, 
one of the really great things that's come out of this collaboration has been the Q series. So the idea here is that it was originally just a large bore tanner, um, and they did have a bass trombone in there right away, that they were instruments that the components were started in Boston, they're built at the Eastman factory by their hand-trained craftsmen and women, and then um, the Shire folks do all of the finishing quality control work there. And so the idea, I, I describe these as entry-level Shire's instruments, but at, frankly, a significantly lower cost, which I think is really, really cool. So they originally started off with just a large bore tanner trombone um, and then added bass trombone there. Um, they've since added a little bit more to it. So they now actually, they, I believe it was two years ago now, they introduced the small bore tanner, the Q33. They do have an alto trombone now. Unfortunately, I haven't got to spend time with it yet, but they do have an alto trombone and they do have an axial flow model bass trombone coming along as well. Uh, we were hoping to get our hands on one actually by this time, but um, didn't end up happening and it sounds like it might be a little bit longer now, but so it is. Um, so. The Q33 here, um, this is in a lot of ways kind of, you know, I mean, it, obviously it's a Shire's design. It's really based off of one of their go-to designs. So it's a 500 bore. Um, it uses, I think this uses their one tuning slide as far as I know, um, eight inch bell. Um, Andrew had a question whether this is available in gold brass and as far as I know, it's not. It's not listed in their catalog. Anything I can find, any of the conversations I've had with Shires, it's never come up that this is available in gold brass, at least at this time. That may come down the road here as well. But more specifically, Andrew was asking about, well, I'm, I play a Q-Series large bore tenor. I've been looking at the Q33. What else would you recommend as far as specifically 508 model small bores? And that's a really great question. When we're thinking about the small bore tenor trombone, we can have some differences in... Um, some of those designs, um, especially how they play between 500 and 508. What I a lot of times find is that if I have somebody who does primarily just small bore tenor work, they can sometimes go between the two. They may like a 500, they may like a 508. If I have folks that do a lot of large bore tenor work, a lot of times the 508 ends up being a lot more familiar. It, Again, like I described with my King 3B, it just feels a little more comfortable, like it's taking my airflow and utilizing it a little bit more efficiently. Um, bass trombone's different, actually. Bass, for some reason, bass trombone players are all over the place, maybe because they're moving to such a different size anyway. And so I'll see bass trombone players who are playing on 500 boards or even smaller than that and making them work great. So bass trombone players who can figure them out. <laughs> but for us tenor players, uh, where we're going through, we can have those differences between the 500 and 508. And for me, it's... It's not so much a, like, for example, I'm going to get a bigger sound out of the 508 or the 500 might be a little more flexible. It's really, for me, more about fitting the instrument to you, our, our airflow. And the result is we're going to have these differences, not only in the size of the sound, but in, especially in terms of the, the presence, how things lock in, the response, the control, the flexibility, all of that. It's going to be affected by those bore sizes. So, again, so the Q33 is actually a... You know, this is really more of a, a 500 bore, so it's a little bit smaller bore. like all of the other Shire's designs. They're very stable. Um, they feel very even playing. The Q33 has always felt a little compact to me, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it feels, it feels like the sound's a little bit tighter. It's a little bit more kind of in one place there. But there are other 508 options out there. Now, we've already heard the King 3B, which has been a go-to for a very, very long time. I describe that sound as having... There's core to the sound, and you can have some flexibility in the timbre, but it has this ring of brightness to it um, that has made it really popular where it feels like you can really carry through um, you know, in a section um, or you know, in solo kind of playing here. But th we do have a couple of other options in the shop here. So for example, this has been one of my favorite go-tos the last, um, especially 
six, nine months, really since it was introduced, this is the XO1634 John Fedchuk model. Um, the 1632 is a 500 bore. I always liked that one, felt it was a little small. The 1634 being the 508, just opens everything up. Now, it's a little bit different. It's a very light instrument. I think, it, it, I've never, I haven't weighed them officially, I think it may be the lightest production small bore tenor on the market. It's just incredibly light, but um, again, I think it's a really, really flexible, versatile instrument. <laughs> this horn is that I can put some air into it, I can get some volume in it, but it still maintains the openness to the sound, whereas the 1632, for example, got a little bit tight, a little bit focused and edgy. Um, I think it's incredibly responsive. <laughs> register slots really well so I would say you know it's something especially if, if you're still comfortable laying back a little bit and letting the horn do a little more of the work being a little bit more efficient I think it's an awesome option if you're somebody who likes to put a lot of air into it wants to get a lot of volume it can get a little bit bright you know and edgy and really really focused um, and especially at those upper dynamics it can start to push a little bit and so I think there are some differences there. Whereas I think with the King 3, it is going to remain a little bit more stable at those upper uh, dynamics in particular. Good. All right, another option. This has been a really popular go-to in the shop for a Boy, quite a while here in, in the trombone world for quite a while. This is the Gesson uh, 3508 Custom Small Bore Tenor. So this is a dual bore 500-508. Um, in case you're not familiar, dual bore just means that the first leg is 500 thousandths of an inch, second leg is 500 eight thousandths of an inch. The reason they do that, some folks say it's, it's about getting an instrument that's more responsive but still having a little bit more open sound. If you talk to a lot of makers, they'll tell you why they do the dual bore is that for certain players, it tends to slot easier. Um, everything just seems to lock in a little bit more. So this has been, again, a really popular um, go-to instrument. Very, very different sound profile than the other two I think you'll find. <laughs> Fedchuk, the 1634, a little bit different depth in the color, and I think the uh, the red brass is probably going to be a part of that. But again, very, very responsive. The slides are always fantastic. Get some slides are always phenomenal there. But I've got one more here as well. And this is one of my personal favorites in the shop right now, specifically the Lawler. Um, so the Lawler trombones, custom-made instruments out of Tennessee by a gentleman, Roy Lawler. He's been doing it now, actually, 35 years, believe it or not. He's been building instruments. His focus really now is on small bore tenors. Um, you know, everything is hand-built in his shop. Um, and what I just love how these instruments play. I think they're really super well balanced. Um, for me, they kind of they balance between like a King and a Con, like the Con 6H, for example, um, where you get some of the, 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 the responsiveness of the King. You get a little bit more depth of sound, but not as dark as sometimes I think the old Cons can get as well. <laughs> have a whole bunch of different things you can change in the setup. Um, I, a lot of times I found I like the nickel silver um, hand size a little bit more. This is one of the other ones where sometimes I almost prefer the 500 over the 508 for them. For whatever reason, they just, just particular setup seems to work well. Um, 
But just the, the responsiveness, the, they just, they, they, it's so fluid moving between the registers. The upper register slots in place better than almost anything else I've ever played. Um, so there are some really options out there, and we didn't even talk about some of the other production options. For example, the Yamaha, the YSL 891Z, um, also 504. That's a, such a fantastic instrument for the price. Um, you know, Bach, obviously, you've got the Bach 16 as well. Uh, we still see folks playing on those. So there are options out there, but there's a few of my favorites here, and at the very least... Let's take a look through it. So we're going to be finishing up about 5 o'clock, so we've got about another 15 minutes or so here, and we've got some other concepts that people want to be talking about here. Uh, we had a question about articulation. Um, so articulation, now there are different approaches to articulation, different thought processes, and so certainly nothing I talk about here is meant to, you know, proceed. Maybe you've got a teacher who's got a different idea. Fantastic. But here's some things that I've learned kind of over my, my years and my experience. And as improving as a player, that's really, really helped me. Um, I've never been a, like a really, really natural player. Um, you know, somebody who can just pick up the instrument and let everything work for it right away. What I end up finding a lot of times, I've, I've had to work at a lot of this, and I've had a lot of things I've done really poorly, and I've had to correct issues. So that what that means is I've learned, okay, I'm not going to do it like this because this way works better, or I avoid this issue by doing it like this. So I've, I've learned some things here. So articulation, the, the best piece of advice that we've gotten about articulation. So articulation, of course, it really is just shaping the sound with the tongue. And really more specifically, it's about shaping the sound with the syllable. And if we approach it like that, um, it, 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 it solves a lot of issues there. So if you want to think about technically, when we articulate, what we're doing is we're stopping the air with the tongue. Ta, ta, ta. If we've got this airflow, the tongue stops it. But that's not really accurate. We, we don't want to think about the air necessarily being stopped because that causes other issues. Um, Kari Sundstrom, who is the second trombonist in the Minnesota Orchestra here, and just such an unbelievable player, great teacher. Um, we're very lucky he comes into the shop on a semi-regular basis, and every time just blows us away with how well he plays. He's just an amazing, amazing player. Um, when I've gotten a chance to take lessons with him, to talk with him, one of the things he said that really stuck with me is that air is our enemy. We, or, yeah, air is not the enemy, our tongue is our enemy. Our, our tongue is the enemy. We only want to use as just as much as we need to shape the note and nothing further. And what that means for me is air is king. Whatever articulation we're trying to use, we have to have the air support behind it. So if we want to visualize, let's say we're trying to get a clean sound. We've got the air coming along here, and we've got the tongue ready. The tongue's ready to move the air, whether we're going to stop the air momentarily, whether we're going to bump the air, whatever we're doing with it, if we don't have the air support behind it, when the tongue shapes that air, it's not going to have the pressure, it's not going to have the push behind it to actually give us the clarity to the articulation that we need. It's going to get soft and fuzzy there. So the question was, for example, you know, I've, I've got a fuzzy articulation. I, I need more clarity. How do I do that? So the first thing I'm gonna, I would recommend, airflow, right? <sighs> Make sure that we're using that air support behind it the whole time, and we're only using the tongue to shape that airflow. So for example, let's just take a middle F. <laughs> start off and I want to make sure it's, I've got a nice secure sound, everything is locked right in place, it feels stable to me. Now I'm going to think about what type of syllable I want to use. So if I want to think about a syllable with some front, some diction to it, I might think about toe um, or I might think about heavy do. I want something with some point to it, toe, toe. But what I'm not doing is I'm ch not changing my airflow. <laughs> I'm thinking about the same air concept all the way through and just using enough of that articulation to create the syllable, to create the shape there. Um, so for example, using toe or using a hard do where you can still get that front to it. 
Think of it like that. Um, and, and what that really accomplishes for me is it means that I've always got the air support behind it. I'm always going to get the note to start the way that I want, and the tongue is just shaping all of that. Um, sometimes when I find I am having articulation issues, so for example, some of the salsa work I do, which is a lot of very upper register playing, it's a lot of very da 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 da, you know, or that kind of work where it's, it's very, very articulate, very short. What I end up finding is that if I'm having issues with it, I'm not supporting with the air enough. I'm not giving myself enough of a chance to actually get the note started before I'm actually worried about the articulation at all. So think about those syllables. If you want more diction, thinking to or do. If you want a little bit softer articulation, thinking a softer do or no or so. When we get into legato articulation, legato is something that seems to really freak a lot of people out. How do we get this really soft connected sound? It's all about that air support again keep that continuity with the air, and now we're thinking a super soft articulation. Again, a really soft do, 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 or tho, or no, using more of the middle of the tongue. It's not going to have that same impact front to it. It's not going to disrupt the airflow as much. that I can even control within that legato how connected do I want that to be. So thinking about all of that, a couple of other ideas to think about. I'm keeping an eye on the time here. A um, couple of other ideas to think about here as well is first off, trying to avoid a lot of jaw movement. It can be really easy when, for example, I'm demonstrating, say, toe, 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 and to let the jaw do a lot of movement there. The problem is if we do a lot of that when we're playing, we're pulling the embouchure out of place. We're disrupting I mean, that's essentially how we do jaw vibrato, right? Is by moving the jaw. If we're doing too much of this while we're actually trying to get an articulation to happen, it's disrupting that airflow. It means that we're going to have more trouble with consistency and response. So trying to keep everything still. To, 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 do, 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 do. One thing I learned to keep an eye on this from uh, one of my professors, Tom Ashworth, at the University of Minnesota, finger on the chin. So when you're articulating, to, 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 make sure you're not feeling that move. If you're feeling to, to, no, no, well, that means you're moving too much. Keep it, you know, keep everything nice and still here. Keep the articulation within the mouth, not outside of the mouth there, right? And more importantly than anything, air support. Support, support, support with that air is going to make a ton of difference. So good. We've got about five, six minutes left here. Let's take a look at what else we've got on the list. Um, good. You know, one thing I want to talk about here, obviously this is a very timely issue right now here, cleaning, right? How do we clean our instruments? What are we doing in the shop, for example, to keep everything clean? So we understand we have some COVID-19 concerns right now, and we are doing a lot of things in the shop right now to try to help mitigate those. Um, you know, for example, right now, because of some of the airborne um, spread concerns, we are not allowing instrument trials in the shop. So we're kind of making an exception today so I can demonstrate some of this and we're going to do a lot of cleaning afterwards here, but we're trying to eliminate some of that. Um, but even when we go through, like for example, when I get done with the video here, I'm going to be cleaning out all of the horns I tried. Um, I'm going to go, into through, go through and clean all of those out. And how am I going to do that? Is with these three. So what we're going to do first off is we know that isopropyl alcohol will kill um, COVID-19. And so we've got alcohol solution here. So what I will be doing is going through and spraying this down um, on our cleaning sheets here. This is a cleaning sheet that we've reserved just for the specific cleaning. So I'm going to spray this all down with alcohol and I'm going to take this and run this through all of our inner slides here. Get all of that cleaned out and then I'm going to take our clean brush here. We're going to spray it down as well. So that way we can get down to the crook as well and really make sure that we're getting down and cleaning through all of that. Um, the outside of the instruments are a little bit interesting. Um, and, and by the way, at home, if you clean out your instrument, um, soap and water has proven to be effective against this as well here. So um, we recommend doing this anyway. This is probably a really good opportunity to do that if you haven't already. You know, if you have one of these cleaning rods and cleaning sheets, fantastic. Honestly, for everyday cleaning, 
the cleaning snake is really where I go to. It's, it's more user friendly. Um, and it, we can get down into the crook um, unless we have one of the really great slide mix cleaning solutions where we've got both the cleaning rod and the flexible brush at the end. And if you don't have one of those, cleaning snake is a really easy go-to with all of this here. Take some, you know, take your, uh, your slide, take it to your kitchen sink, take it to your wash tub, your bathtub, put some nice warm water inside, put a little bit of dish soap inside of there and take your cleaning snake or whatever cleaning implements you have, go through and clean it out there. Not only is your instrument going to perform better and you're going to hopefully prevent red rot issues, but you're going to hopefully keep yourself healthier and safer as well. And that's really super important right now. So um, by the way, speaking of soap and water, with all of the instruments, we're going to wipe, be wiping all of the contact surfaces down with soap and water as well. We don't want to use alcohol because alcohol can have a negative effect on lacquer. Um, it can serve as, you know, basically a, a dissolving agent. So we don't want that. So we're going to use soap and water to wipe down all of the exterior of the instruments as well. They're trying to make sure we can do everything we can to keep everybody healthy and happy. Got it. So we have a couple of other things as well. We had a question from uh, Jamie about practice mutes here. So just quick. Practice mute options. Um, and I've got some videos about different practice mutes as well on the channel here. But the big thing with practice mutes, of course, is that we're trying to attenuate the sound. We're trying to bring the sound down significantly so that we can actually practice in a quiet setting, whether it's practicing early in the morning, late at night, practicing in an apartment. I utilize these a lot when I'm on the road traveling and I want to practice in a hotel room. Um, but by bringing down the volume that much, of course, that means we're stopping a lot of airflow, which can have some really negative effects on the overall response control in the different ranges kind of throughout the instrument. And it doesn't feel as natural as well. Um, a lot of folks, I think for good reason, really kind of, as much as possible recommend against practicing practicing with practice mutes, at least on an extended basis. Because however good the practice mute, I've never played one yet that feels exactly like an open instrument. It's, it, it's just, you know, it's very tip difficult to do. And so we're trying to balance all of these different ideas um, and try, you know, for me, if I have a choice between practicing and not practicing, I'm going to practice. I want the horn on my face. I want the experience. I, I want to be making music, right? So if I have to, if I have to practice with the practice mute, I'm going to use a practice mute there, but we want to try to mitigate some of those things as much as possible. So, Protex, um, and there are a couple of others as well. Um, the uh, Best Brass has got a version like this, and there's some others out there like this as well. Um, so, aluminum mute, very small profile. This will fit inside the bell of the instrument inside the case. So, this is one of my travel mutes. So, if I'm going somewhere, I always have this in my instrument, in my gig bag. Um, but because of the design, there is quite a bit of back pressure. Um, it, it's, it's fairly resistant, um, so it's not something I like to use all of the time. But again, if I'm in a, a, a hotel room situation where I didn't want to bring a bigger practice mute, or let's say I'm getting ready for a performance, I'm sitting behind stage or something, and I just want to blow a few notes, you know what, these are great, and they're fairly cost effective as well. On the other extreme, we've got the Yamaha. Uh, silent brass system here. Um, this is the second generation of the silent brass system. The original ones came out, oh, had to be the late 1990s, maybe around 2000 or so. I had one of the original versions. Those mutes were about yay long, big torpedo shaped things. They kind of had a lot of the same effect like the Joe Ralph bucket mute did, where it's very, very front heavy. Um, they've gone through and done a lot of redesign here. This is obviously the profile sits a lot more inside of the bell now as well. And uh, what a lot of people like with the Yamaha system is it does come with a, a brass their uh, brass modeling system. So this is a module you have in. You plug in here, it has a, actually not just a microphone, this has a condenser, a powered condenser microphone there. So in order to get the, the, the full effect with the system, you actually have to use the module, which is powering the microphone. Um, so it runs through there and then you can put headphones in or you can run it out to another external source as well. And then you're getting a, a frankly a, a pretty realistic performance experience it sounds good i actually have one of these at home i'm using right now um and it does a really good job you're getting a lot of what you would get in a natural environment there's a couple of reverb settings um but um where a lot of people actually end up using them as well is for effects work as well so you can take the output from your module run it through effects pedals or run it through different um, systems and setups, and then you can do all sorts of different things as far as effects go and pedal work and all of that kind of thing there. So really, really nice option. They are fairly expensive. They're running around like $190 thereabouts. 
the Shpew has been a real go-to for us in the shop. This is designed by Bremner Brass, which is based out of New Zealand. Um, this is um, just a plastic shell. Not a whole lot going on with it, but just the physics, how it's designed, means that it's, it's fairly quiet mute. I would say it's not as quite as quiet as, for example, the uh, the Protect, the Liberty Practice mute, but it is substantially more free-blowing. Um, it's a very natural plain mute, and I like it's very lightweight um, because it's just a plastic shell as well. Um, the Protec is what I have in my gig bag when I'm traveling. The sh mute is what I use in my practice room at home when I need to practice with a mute. This is my first go-to with that. Um, I love how they how they play. I think, and, and they're really great balance. They're more expensive than the the Protec, but quite a bit less than the Yamaha. So I think they do a really nice job of balancing all of that. So I really appreciate all of the feedback and everything that people provide. Again, all of the great comments and discussions that were happening kind of throughout the live stream here. That's really the goal. Hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again. Now, quick note, we did just find out this afternoon that um, here in Minnesota, we are going to be going into a shelter in place for the next couple weeks here. Um, so we've got a couple days of business left. We're going to be open through Friday. And so there's a lot of different things we're going to be working on here right now. But one of the big things we want to make sure everybody knows is that we are going to stay out there. We're going to stay available. Um, and so my plan is I'm going to continue to create new content out there. I'm going to keep trying to you know, put out new videos. It's going to be obviously in my home now, but that's just fine. And so I'll be keeping, you know, trying to keep busy with a lot of that, but I want you to know that we are accessible. So as you go through, if you have questions, please check, you know, find us. You can, of course, you know, comment on any of the videos. I sometimes get backlogged on some of the video comments because we have so many people commenting, which is fantastic, but I always do my level best to answer all of those comments, you know, answer any questions I might be able to do, but you can get a hold of us more directly as well. Um, easiest way to get a hold of us is through our email. Um, it's really easy to remember, tromboneshop at schmidtmusic.com. And again, trombone shop at schmidtmusic.com. Or if you just, if you Google trombone shop, we're going to come up pretty quickly. We do have a full service website on there. Um, we try to keep all of our inventory, everything updated on there. Now there, quick side note, there are some few questions and we're still working on figuring out as far as what we're going to be able to do with online orders. There's a good chance the next couple of weeks we may not be able to fulfill online orders. Um, and that should be reflected through the website, hopefully. But rest assured, if you have questions or if you have things you're looking for, you know, you can still put in those orders. We'll get to them right away. Or just please reach out to us. Let me know if you have questions. I'm going to be out there available. My whole job, my goal is to be a resource for the trombone community. And I really appreciate how the community has embraced that you know, the questions they bring forth. So if there's anything I can do to help you and what you do in making music, please let me know. That is what I am here for. So I really, really hope you enjoyed the live stream here. You know, please keep an eye out there. Hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again here. And most importantly, take care of each other out there. Stay safe, stay well, and keep making music. Everything's going to come back to where we were eventually here, and we're going to be, I think, the better for it, and music is going to help us along the way. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope to catch you around again soon.